So let's finish our discussion of the quotient group, because so far we only have a set here. So now we have our proposition. Um, G mod H. Well, I shouldn't start with this. What I should start with is if, and this is the key thing that we need here. We don't just, having H be a subgroup of G is not enough. We need H to be a normal subgroup of G. So this is another reason why normal subgroups are really important. So if H is a normal subgroup of G, then G mod H with the product, we're going to let G, i learn how to write. So our product is going to be G1H times G2H is going to equal, well, the easiest thing we can think of is G1, G2H. So this, <laughs> the produce, <laughs> I just ate. I don't know why I'm thinking about food right now. The product given by G1H times G2H is G1, G2H. This is, um, so G mod H with this product is a group. We call it the quotient group. Okay, so let's prove that this works. Um, uh, so let, uh, I hate the notation in this proof. Let G1 be equivalent to G1 prime and G2 be equivalent to G2 prime. Uh, we need to show that G1, G2 is equivalent to G1 prime, G2 prime. And why is that what we're looking for? So G1 is equivalent to G1 prime. So G1 and G1 prime belong to the same coset, and G2 and G2 prime belong to the same coset. What we want is we want... Okay, so here we go. Um... So let's think about it. What could possibly be the issue here? Um, why would this product not be a group? Um, it's a group and a product. Obviously, this has the identity. Um, So basically what we're checking here is that if we replace this, this, and this, if we replace all of these, um, like the G1s and the G2s, if we replace them with um, different coset representatives, then it's going to be the same. Actually, let me think about this for a, for a second here. Why do we need G1, G2 is equivalent to G1 prime, G2 prime?
Well, I mean, let's think about it. So, we want to prove that this is a group. We need to prove that it has an identity. Well, one thing that you should be able to see is that the identity is just going to be H. Because if you take... Um, because H is equal to E times H. So if you take like G1H times E times H, then that's going to be G1EH, which is just G1H. And similarly, if we replace G1 with E, we're going to have EH. Wait, did I, did I start with G1H, G2H? It doesn't matter. Whichever way, uh, you can sort of convince yourself in that way that H, that H or EH is the identity element of this group here. Um, and then, of course, if you have any two elements of G, then... Okay. Oh, okay, okay. Here, th this, this, this is the issue. Okay, so um, this product is a map. It's a map from G mod H cross G mod H into G mod H. So it should be obvious from this, um, because uh, the, this product just takes a product um, and, and just makes it a product here, the fact that G itself is a group means that this is going to work nicely. And so it means that so long as this function, uh, as long as everything works here, it's going to be fine. The issue is that this function does not need to be well defined. And that's because remember, when we, uh, when we plug something into the function, we have to make a choice of our uh, coset representative here. And so yeah, this is what I was mentioning beforehand, but now I really kind of see what that really means, and not just like what sorts of words are probably the right ones to use in that scenario. This, we need to choose a coset represent, whenever we take two elements of G mod H, we're taking two elements of cosets. And so we need to make a choice of which elements of these cosets we're going to use. And we have to show that it doesn't matter what we, which ones we do. So let's say we have, we use G1 and G2 here. Let's say that instead we are to choose G1 prime and G2 prime as our coset elements, then what we need to prove is we need to prove that this coset here that we get by taking G1, G2, H is going to be the same coset that we would get by taking G1 prime, G2 prime, H, i.e. we need to prove that G1, G2 is equivalent to G1 prime, G2 prime. All right, so there we go. Glad that I figured that out. So we need this is equivalent to that. Um, so, um, uh, let's see here. So, we know, um, just by definition of the, or just by our equivalence relation, we know that G1 inverse G1 prime and G2 inverse G2 prime are both contained in H. Right, because that's what it means to be equivalent. Um, so, if we look at um, G1, G2 inverse G1 prime, G2 prime, Remember, what we want, what are we trying to prove? To prove that these two are equivalent, we need this inverse, the inverse of this times this to be an H. So we want this thing to be an H. So let's see if we can do some computations. Um, so this is equal to, well, this is G2 inverse, G1 inverse, G1 prime, G2 prime, which we can write as being equal to G2 inverse, G1 inverse, G1 prime, and then we have, just 
did I do here? Oh, so before we get to this G2 Prime, we're going to insert a G2 and a G2 inverse. So then we have this G2 Prime. And of course we can do that because G2 times G2 inverse is just E. And you can throw an E wherever you want. And let's see here. So G2 inverse, G2 prime. Hmm. Okay, so we know that H is normal. First of all, we know that G2 inverse, this is in H. And then we also know that this thing is in H. And so, but remember, now this, this is the key. This is the key. H is normal in G. And so the fact that G1 inverse G prime, or yeah, G1 inverse G1 prime is in H means that if we conjugate it by G2 inverse, i.e. we multiply on the left by G2 inverse and on the, on the left by G2 inverse and on the right by G2 inverse inverse, which is just G2, then we stay in H. So that's where we use normality. So it turns out that this whole thing is in H. And so then this is just this times this, which is a product of two things in H, and so this is in H. Okay. So, thus, G1, G2 is equivalent to G1 prime, G2 prime. Okay. So, yeah, we just needed to um, check that this map, this product is a well-defined function. And that's, that's really all we needed for this. Um, everything else worked out fine. Now, I know this is pretty wasteful. I think I'm going to start using paper towels because... I could use like cloths for all of these, but then I'd just be, that would just be way too much laundry. I don't have the resources to take care of that. Or at least I have other things to use my resources on. But anyways, so this finishes this part. And now, Let's take an example, uh, or rather let's do a proposition. If H is normal in G, then the map pi, this is for projection, not for the 3.14. It goes from G to G mod H. Uh, given by uh, pi applied to g is g h, so it sends an element of g to its coset. Um, is a group homomorphism, and the kernel of pi is equal to h. Okay. So let's prove this. Um, uh, the product of G, well, I, I guess I should stick with how we've been doing this before. Actually, let's use, yeah. So the product of uh, G1, G2, well, this is just G1, G2, H. But remember, how does uh, how is our quotient group work? G1, G2, H is G1, H, G2, H. So this is G1H, G2H. 
G2H. But look, GH is just pi of G. So this is um, pi of G1, pi of G2. Um, so, uh, pi is indeed a homomorphism from G to G mod H. Um, okay, now we want the kernel of um, pi to be H. So, next if H is an H, then H is equivalent to E, and so, um, um, pi of h is equal to hh, which is just eh, which is h. I mean, I, I probably wrote too many details here, but eh. So, pi of h is this. Thus, we know that h is contained in the kernel of pi. If um, if we have some g in kernel of pi, um, then pi of g equals g h equals h. So if g h equals h, then g is in h, and so thus the kernel of h kernel of pi is contained in h. And hence, we have the kernel of pi is equal to h. And so there we go. That is our proposition. Um, and yeah, I think we'll call it a session there, and then I'll continue with the next part.